Is email marketing dead? Absolutely not. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you exactly how we got this client an additional $80,000 from email alone in 30 days. This is going to be a full email marketing masterclass that's going to show you exactly how to set up your core four, how to set up pop-ups, how to go through and optimize every single one of your flows and campaigns. This is the most in-depth email marketing content that I have ever made. I'm revealing a ton of our agency secrets. So if you want to see that, make sure you stick around. Okay. And the very first thing that of course we are going to have to do is we're going to have to hop on Clavio here and show you guys the results. So as you can see, in the last 30 days, our client has generated $445,000 and 18% of that is coming from Clavio. So that's $80,000 in additional revenue. Now, whenever we're looking at these numbers, it's important to kind of take into account that this is early on in the email process. As you start to get more in depth with email, you're not only collecting a larger list, but you're also figuring out how to speak to your audience more clearly. One of the biggest obstacles when it comes to email marketing is going to be the messaging. You always have to have that product to market fit and you want to make sure that you speak to that market appropriately. So whenever you're first getting started, maybe it's some very basic messaging. You start to have an idea of kind of who roughly your demographic is, but as you start to scale up and as you start to optimize your email flows in your campaigns even more, it definitely starts to become more dialed in and you start to see even more revenue coming from email. For us, our goal is to get this client to 30% of overall revenue generated from email in the next two months, which if we did that would be over six figures a month from email alone. Now, when we look at this, there's two different types of emails that you're going to be kind of concerned with. There's going to be flows and then there's going to be campaigns. A flow is an automation. This is something that is sent out automatically after something has been triggered. So for example, let's kind of just take a look at the top here. We have all of our pre uh, pre flows here. These are all pre purchase. Then we have some post flows. Those are post purchase. Makes sense. Pretty, uh, pretty self explanatory there. Each one of these is going to be followed by a trigger, something that happens where then this flow follows. So whenever a, uh, so whenever somebody adds to list here, we are then going to follow up with a welcome flow. This is a full automation series that we completely go through. Uh, next is going to be pre. This is after a checkout has been started. We will then hit them with an abandoned checkout. Let's go ahead and hop into our abandoned checkout here. This is one that people are always curious about. And let's kind of break this down. Now, if you're just getting started with email marketing, the best thing that you could do is get your tracking set up and then go and set up your flows. Your basic flows will include an abandoned cart, an abandoned checkout, browse abandonment, and site abandonment. That will get you started and that will lay your foundation. As soon as you're starting to collect this data, starting to get your tracking working properly, and you're starting to build up your list, you could then start to get a little bit more fancy with it. Now, I'm assuming that a lot of you guys are just getting started with email marketing, so we're not gonna get too in-depth with that and what we do for our clients, but but uh, what this will kind of tell you is roughly what we're doing uh, at a baseline level. So let's go ahead and talk about the abandoned checkout here. Now, as you can see, this is a few different items. We have email number one, email number two, email number three, and then this fourth email right here. This was actually a A to B split test, which is why I'm showing you guys this. Whenever we are getting started with a client, we are always going to get everything set up and then immediately jump into A to B split testing. Now you can split test just about anything. You can split test timing. You can split test headlines. You can split test offers. You could get as fancy or as not fancy with it as you want. The biggest rule of thumb that we have is number one, we only are going to be split testing one thing at a time. So if we're going to be split testing headlines, that's all we're testing. If we're testing offers, we're going to test offers. That's it. If we're going to test time, we're only testing time. That's it. We're not going to mix and match, make it so it's super complicated. It's one thing at a time. Uh, next is going to be that we have to have statistical significance, meaning there has to be a substantial difference in the performance for us to come to a conclusion. If there is no substantial difference, either, either we'll cut the A to B split test, uh, early and just say, okay, there's not a, uh, this, this test wasn't good, or we'll just let it run for longer, which typically if we set up the uh, A to B split test properly, we'll just let it run for longer. The third thing is, which kind of goes into that last point is we have to make it so that the split test is actually different. A lot of the times, whenever people are split testing, they go for the super small things immediately. They're going to go for uh, just a headline difference where it's going to be one has an emoji and one doesn't, or they're going to make it so that they're going to split test hour 45 minute delivery versus two hour delivery, that 15 minute difference. Whenever we're split testing, we're gonna make it so that the split test is drastic, which I'll show you guys what we did here. 
Whenever we first launched this email, and I left this here so I could show you guys, we had it so we had a conditional split. This just divides the traffic 50-50. So, you know, one person sees one and one person sees another. And we made it so that one group was seeing the abandoned checkout email, the very first one, after two hours. The second group, we made it so that they were seeing it after five minutes. And that's what this uh, email is right here. We let this run for a while and we saw that there was a pretty significant difference. So let's take a look. The open rate was 28% on split test A. On split test B, the open rate was 35%. That's a 7% increase overall. That is massive, massive, massive difference. But let's go ahead and continue. Click-through rate is 9% here. Click-through rate is 8%. So not only are we having more people open, but we're also having more people click. Now, the next thing that we're going to look at is the placed order rate. Now, this is the only thing that we're actually going to be paying attention to because you know the whole saying, if it makes dollars, <laughs> then it makes sense, right? And so here we go, 2.7% placed order rate. When we go up here, 3.8% placed order rate. So that one change, that one change of going five minutes versus two hours, not only increased our open rate, not only increased our click-through rate, but also incre increased, man, I'm having a hard time saying that, <laughs> increased our placed order rate. That is what I would call a successful split test. So if you are trying to optimize, if you're trying to make is so that your email is really hard hitting. Typically, it's not going to be one thing that you do. It's these constant adjustments that you are making over time. This is what we're doing for our clients every single day. We always have split tests running because you could always just make it 1% better and you stack up those 1% over and over again. It's sort of a compounding effect that makes it parabolic and really grow quickly. Whenever we're getting the core four set up, which is those four abandonment series that I just talked about a minute ago, uh, whenever we're getting those set up, typically we're only going to start with two emails. The reason we're doing this is because a lot of people tend to think that more emails will just duplicate the results. If you're sending out a ton of emails, then obviously it's going to be better because then you're driving more revenue. And that's a very common misconception because what you have to be doing is you actually have to be paying attention to the open rates and the click-through rates. These levels of engagement is not only being monitored by you, but it's also being monitored by email providers. And if they're starting to see that not many people are actually interested in what you're sending them, not many people are are clicking. This doesn't match up with the audience very well. What's going to end up happening is you're going to end up in the promotions tab or even worse, the spam box. And so we start with less and then make it more as long as the metrics match up. So here we're going to be looking at a 20% open rate. So we'll start with both emails. And as long as both of those emails have over a 20% open rate, then we'll add on a third email. So you can see here, we added on this third email and that's also a 30% open rate. So if this continues to stay consistent for us, we'll go ahead and add on a fourth email and start to make it more long tail over time as long as the engagement's there. If the engagement isn't there and people aren't interested in actually going through and clicking this email and interacting, then we're going to go ahead and skip it and move on to the next one. Now that was a perfect example of split testing different times, but there's a ton of other split tests that you would do. I would say the bulk of our split tests, about 60% of them is going to be copywriting. It's going to be the messaging. One of the most difficult things that you will do as an email marketer is figuring out how to speak to your audience properly. And as soon as you start to kind of crack that code with one flow or one campaign or one series, you start to get a better idea of what your audience avatar is and who they are and how you have to speak to them. As soon as you start to really dial that in, then you could go through and start to sort of transcribe the rest of your emails to make it so that they match up with that one series that hits very well with you. Now, some of the base things that we keep in mind whenever we are actually crafting our emails is one, we have to make it so that the brand's identity is really seen through. If you're just getting started with your email, one of the easiest ways you could do that is develop a color palette, figure out what types of fonts that you're going to use consistently, and always include your logo. As soon as you start to do that, the overall congruency for your brand is going to be very consistent, which makes it so that you start to have your brand identity inside of your emails, which is awesome. The second thing that we do is we always answer three questions. We answer one, why should somebody open this email? This is developing a compelling headline. Here, we're going to ask questions. We're going to make it so that we're building curiosity. A lot of the times people are going to try to sell inside of the headline, which sometimes can work. But typically what we're going to be selling them on is opening the email. We're trying to build that curiosity as high as possible. The second question that we're going to be answering is why should they read through this? This is sort of a rule for us where we save the best for first. A lot of the times people want to save the best for last and kind of push off all of that sauce until the very end of the email. We're going to put it right at the beginning and make it so that it's hard hitting. 
Third is why should they click? Why should they care enough to actually click and go to the website? You have to have a compelling call to action. You have to have a compelling offer. But as soon as you start to have a good idea of what your overall audience avatar is, it's so much easier to write your copywriting. So one of my favorite copywriting frameworks is going to be Pastor. Now, I did not make this. I believe the person that made this, his name is Ray Edwards, so credit to him. But the Pastor framework is going to be P stands for pain. What is your audience's pain? A is aspiration. What are they looking to achieve? What are they looking to get from your product? S is going to be solution. How is your product going to connect the pain to the aspiration and give them that transformation? T is testimonial. Why are you guys credible? Why are you credible? Why is your product or your company credible? O is going to be offer. What exactly are you offering them? Is it full price? Come and get it. Or is it 10% off, 20% off, buy one, get one free. Being crystal clear on that really, really helps. And then R is reaction. What is the call to action? Whenever we are writing emails, the call to action has to be crystal clear. You can't make it ambiguous. There should only be one call to action. One of the worst things that you could do whenever you're developing your email is start to write a bunch of different call to actions telling them to subscribe to your YouTube channel, give a like on Instagram, go through and buy your products. There should be only one direction that they should be going to and that's to your website. Okay, next we are going to be talking about tracking. Tracking is one of the most important foundational aspects of your email marketing, but for some reason, a lot of people don't pay attention to them. This is kind of nice with tracking. Once you set it up, you're pretty much good to go. You don't really have to mess with it. Periodically, we will check on it, but it's sort of a set it and forget it kind of thing. Now, the way that you're going to set this up is you're going to integrate your Klaviyo with your Shopify store. That's as simple as going to the app store, downloading Klaviyo and getting them connected. This should give you a lot of these baseline tracking and analytics, right? So you should be able to have canceled order, checkout started, any of them with the Shopify logo, you should have automatically. These Klaviyo logos right here, these are ones that are automatically integrated through Klaviyo. So the bulk of these should be set up. The one thing that you will have to do is you'll have to go to your integrations right over here, press view settings on Shopify, and then you're going to be landed on this page. I don't want to scroll up because then it's going to reveal our client store and I don't want to do that. But what you will have to do is you'll have to make it so that it automatically adds Klaviyo on-site JavaScript. That will give you the bulk of the analytics that you need. The last one that you'll need is an add to cart snippet. I'll include a blog down below by Klaviyo that is really awesome and it'll show you exactly how to get this added to cart function here. Once you have that, all of your tracking will be set up properly. Then at that point, then you could go through and build all of your flows. Now that you have your core four initiated and then you also have your tracking all set up, the last thing that you're going to have to do is set up a pop-up. Now, I know a lot of people are very concerned about pop-ups. They're worried that the conversion rate optimization is going to be messed up and whatnot. And what I will say is it is important to set up your pop-up correctly. If you set it up incorrectly, it can be very intrusive and it actually can mess up the conversion rate. But if you set it up properly, it won't be intrusive and it'll only show to very specific customers. Now, what I want to show you here is we actually did have a split test on this client's store. You can see that this pop-up has been submitted almost almost 10,000 times across the board, which is insane. Our current pop-up submit rate is 11%, which is very, very high. Uh, this was the split test that we were running, and now we have it so that it's at 11%. So we're actually running another split test currently. What I do want to show you is the behavior. How do we have our pop-up set up so that you can make it so that it's not intrusive on your store as well? Now, for this pop-up, there's going to be very specific criteria that they have to meet before this pop-up will show. Number one is they have to show exit intent. Number two, they have to be on the website for at least six seconds and then they also have to scroll 50 percent of the page they have to meet all of these criteria in order for the pop-up to actually show now this is something that we have split tested for this client and this is not typically how we would set up initially the big thing that we would change here is it would typically be 12 seconds after page load and not six but we have split tested it for this client and this is what has ended up performing better for us now not every single client is the same not every brand in the audience is the same so what we will do is we'll start with a baseline and start to split test. And that's really where we start to see brands differentiate. So if I was just getting this set up, I would do show when visitor exits the page, show after 12 seconds, show after 50%. As long as you have that set up, that'll start to collect the data. It won't be showing it to everybody. So it's not going to be intrusive. And you'll start to get some people introduced to your brand so that you could start sending them that welcome series. So if I was just getting started with this and I have a brand that is performing well and I need to scale up my email marketing, number one, 
get your tracking set up, guys. Tracking is something that if you have it set up in the background, you don't have to utilize it immediately, but you can't go back and get data if you didn't have your tracking set up. So if you have it set up, it's gonna start collecting the data. That way, whenever you do decide that you wanna use it, it's there for you, it's good to go. I would set up your core four. That is going to be your four abandonment flows that I talked about a little bit earlier in this video. That alone should get you about 5% of your overall revenue to start to convert from email. Now, over time, the third step is going to be optimized. Constantly be optimizing, constantly be running split tests that are going to show some significance. As long as you do that, your email will slowly start to become really, really good. This is something that we're doing for our clients every single day. And if you have a brand that is currently doing over $20,000 a month and you want to work with my agency, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave a link down below for you to book a call with me. On that call, we'll discuss what your brand is, where you guys are currently, and where you're wanting to head with your email marketing in the future. We work with brands anywhere that are doing $20,000 a month up to $1 million a month. So we have a pretty wide spectrum of people that we could kind of pull from and show you guys kind of what we're doing. Uh, but that's going to be it for this video, guys. I hope you did enjoy it. If you did, make sure you smash the thumbs up button and hit that red subscribe button if you want to see more email marketing content like this. That's going to be it for this one, though, guys. I will see you on the next video. Peace.